Okay. All right, we are recording. And a good evening to you, Ben Hur. Good evening, sir. All right. I think, Rocky, I can get the rest of my material in for the class here this evening. Um, we may need to take a little bit of extra time, or maybe not. It entirely depends on how this goes, but uh, there is a very good chance that I can complete the remainder of my lecture material tonight. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then we can talk about offline, Rocky, if, uh, you know, what we may be looking at for the future. But anyway, I should be able to finish everything here this evening. All right, let's go ahead and begin our time with prayer, brothers. Father, thank you for this new day. And thank you for the Lord Jesus, who gave his life as a ransom for us. We thank you uh, that he has been the one to shed abroad his grace in our hearts. And we pray that we might set him apart in our hearts as holy, that we would always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is within us, and that we might not fear, but setting him apart as holy in our hearts. We pray for your grace to be those who defend the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, let's uh, go ahead and jump right into it. And to get us back up to speed, we talked about last time arguing by presupposition and what that meant. And it's a different way of trying to seek to prove the existence of God and the truthfulness of Christianity. Uh, arguing by presupposition is different than what you find in the classical tradition or the evidentialist tradition. So those are two terms that you should be familiar with. The classical approach to apologetics is generally characterized by the approach of St. Thomas Aquinas and Anselm of Canterbury, where they seek to make logical, rational argumentation for the existence of God. Thomas Aquinas, of course, with the cosmological argument and Anselm with the ontological argument. And we've talked about those already in past lectures. You should be familiar with all of those things in order to master the entirety of, uh, of this material. But whereas uh, the approach that you find within the classical tradition is seeking to approach the proof for the existence of God directly, that is to say, through direct argumentation that of a rational and um, a logical sort, really philosophical, we might even say metaphysical, which is part of the reason why Anselm's argument is called ontological because it's an argument based on ontology or metaphysics, principles of being, if you will. Um, and so that approach is much more sort of direct. In other words, uh, it, it's an argumentation directly towards, it's linear. It starts with a, a preposition, I'm sorry, a proposition, and then seeks to build proposition on top of proposition until eventually you arrive at the existence of God. Now, this uh, here Van Til calls the blockhouse approach to apologetics because it's building blocks on top of blocks, rising upward until finally you get to the existence of God. But even then, once you have proven on the classical approach the existence of God, you have yet to prove Christianity. So um, you still need another block in order to build the house of Christianity. And even Thomas Aquinas acknowledges that being able to move from the proof for the existence of God on the basis of pure natural reason or philosophy, that you then need to move into the area of, of Christian theology in order to get to the true God, the, uh, the, the triune God, the Christian God, Jesus. Uh, and you can't do that on the basis of reason for Thomas Aquinas. You need to be able to make use of special revelation. That's the language we would use. He would say scripture. Um, 
And uh, so um, you still need, <clears throat> excuse me, from, from the point of proof of an, the existence of a generic deity, you then need to move to proving specifically the existence of the Christian God. And uh, just to go ahead and welcome everyone, uh, looks like we've gathered together some more students, so welcome um, everyone who's here. Richard's here and John Paul, so welcome brothers, glad you can join us. Um, so um, that's that's what we were talking about. The, the approach, <clears throat> that's got, that approach has problems, numerous problems on the basis of reformed theology. It's not consistent with reformed theology. Part of the reason why it's not consistent with reformed theology is not saying that the arguments don't have philosophical validity or that somehow their illogical arguments are arguments that fail the test of reason. Uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, part of the problem with the blockhouse approach is number one, it begins with with seeking to prove logically by way of pure natural reason the existence of a generic God, um, a God who is sort of faceless, nameless, if you will, a higher being. And um, that's a problem because that higher being is not the true and living God. Uh, the true and living, it, it's its merely an idol. Any God that is that is proven on the grounds of pure human natural reason can only be an idol. And part of the reason why is because we reformed believe in total depravity. Romans chapter one, verses 18 and following talk about the way in which, uh, in which the unbeliever takes the, um, uh, the knowledge of God that is communicated through general revelation and he twists it automatically the moment he begins to talk about god he gets god wrong that is because the um unenlightened or the unilluminated mind can only pervert the evidence can pervert philosophy in a way that is against the glory of god not for the glory of god so um that's part of the problem with the classical approach so what van till is introducing is an indirect proof, um, an indirect method of proving the existence of God and the truthfulness of Christianity. And what he means by indirect is that it's not a linear argumentation that goes from basic propositions built on top of each other until finally you come to a conclusion. It actually begins with the conclusion, which is what you have to do if you're going to stay faithful to the true the one true and living God revealed in the pages of scripture. Okay. So the God who is revealed in scripture is the basis for articulation of any truth whatsoever. Without that God, without the triune God, nothing else makes sense. You have to begin with that God. And so what Van Til is saying is that we need to make our argumentation first presupposing the existence of the one true and living God, the triune God, the God that is revealed in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, along with the self-attesting Christ of scripture. So we don't, in other words, put the Christian God to the side for a moment when we engage the unbeliever. We don't sort of say with the unbeliever, well, you know, maybe you're right, that God doesn't exist. Let's start on neutral ground, some place where the believer and the unbeliever can agree, and then move from there. No, because that's actually to betray the one true and living God at the outset, to put God in the dock and to put him in a place where we can assume with the unbeliever the possibility of his non-existence is to betray God at the outset. We don't say that there's a chance that maybe the unbeliever is correct in his denial of the existence of the one true and living God. Um, that's that's a betrayal of God. Um, we don't, God doesn't need to be proven. He is proof. He is, he, he exists. And we begin with that presupposition in order to make sense 
of the rest of reality. So what uh, Van Til is going to propose is seeking to prove the existence of the true God by the impossibility of the contrary. Um, and that's something that that's a principle of apologetics. I want everybody to take to heart is the impossibility of the contrary. We're seeking to reason with the unbeliever, seeking to show the unbeliever that that his or her worldview actually leads to futility. It leads to futility. In other words, it's it's a worldview that cannot stand under its own weight. And so what we're seeking to do is to show that his or her worldview, the atheistic worldview, as an example, um, cannot sustain the truth claims that are being made by those unbelievers. Okay, Their worldview cannot sustain the truth claims that are being proposed by the unbeliever. And I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit of time here to give you some examples of, of that and concrete ways that you can engage in the un, with the unbeliever in this way, in this indirect approach, by seeking to prove the impossibility of the contrary. So what is it that we seek to do then when we engage with the unbeliever? When we engage the unbeliever, we engage their truth claims as claims that cannot stand on the basis of his or her own presuppositions, or we might say worldview. Um, so let's, the first step, the first concrete step that we can take in the engagement of the unbeliever along these lines is to step on his or her ground, right? His or her own presuppositions and assume to ourselves the worldview of the unbeliever only for the sake of argument, okay? We adopt the worldview of the unbeliever not because it's true or valid or has potential validity. It doesn't. We step on the ground and we assume the presuppositions of the unbeliever temporarily and merely for the sake of argument. And as we do that, we find and now we can show the unbeliever that the unbeliever's claims, truth claims, cannot be supported by the worldview or the presuppositions, namely of the non-existence of God, that they claim. So um, there are a number of ways in which we can engage the unbeliever this way. Let's say we're talking to an atheist, an atheist that assumes a basic Darwinian or evolutionary worldview, okay, um, or a materialistic worldview, which is to say the same thing. Um, a materialistic worldview is wholly naturalistic, okay? There is no supernatural. There, there is nothing that exists beyond matter. That's materialism. And um, so basically what you have within the worldview of an atheistic, materialistic perspective is everything is explained and understood in terms of chance and change over time. Chance plus change plus time gives us variation and explains the experience of man. All of our experience can be understood according to the atheistic, materialistic worldview. All of our experience can be explained by chance and change over time. Okay? So, and this is what uh, one thing we said last time, two weeks ago, I commended to you the uh, the debate, the Gordon Stein, uh, the Bonson Stein debate. And uh, Rocky had uh, given us links already to that. So hopefully you had a chance to listen to that that debate because you'll get a really good concrete sense of what I'm talking about here. But anyway, let's say um, 
let's say that's who we're talking to, an unbeliever who is an atheist materialist committed to chance and change over time. Okay. Now, his first objection, just as an example of how we might engage in him, the first example that that he might level uh, uh, of an argument that he might level against us is to say, well, the problem with Christianity and the reason why I don't believe it is because it is irrational. It's illogical. And now, OK, all right. So we've got that claim. All right. That's the truth claim that he is he is making he or she is making. Um, the further truth claim that goes along with that is that there is, in fact, the existence of reason and there is the existence of logic, that there are laws of logic, that there are principles of reasoning that are there in the mind of this particular atheist. And, um, and, and OK, we can agree with that. We can say, yeah, we agree that there are there are laws of logic. Uh, we've got the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, so forth and so on. And so we can agree with him on all of those things, but we can't agree with him on the reason why those things are valid, why that reasoning approach is valid, why, why approaching things logically is a valid way to approach things, because he has no basis for logic or for reasoning. So we say, okay, let's, um, let's say, let's say um, you're correct that there is no God and all you have is a materialistic world or materialistic universe where there is chance and change over time. Okay. Now, if that's the case, where do you get your laws of logic from? Where do those come from? Because an impersonal, illogical, irrational, materialistic universe cannot produce principles and laws of logic. You, uh, otherwise, what you would say at that, at, that, at that level is what the atheist would have to conclude is that there is such a thing as creation ex nihilo that there is something that comes from nothing, namely laws of logic that come from an illogical, irrational universe, because it's simply materialistic. Um, there is no mind within a materialistic worldview, within a materialistic system. And if there's no mind, there can be no logic. There can be no rationality. It's a, it's a completely and wholly irrational um, understanding of reality or a reality that is completely and totally irrational. Why is it irrational? Because it's simply materialistic. There is no mind. There is no spirit. There is no person. There is only matter. So um, he can't even begin to substantiate his claim that there are laws of logic and that the laws of logic are necessary for us to engage in and to follow and that the laws of logic provide for us any type of argumentation against Christianity or against theism of any kind, because you can't substantiate the existence of the laws of logic. Now, we can. We have a reason for it. We have a reason for reason. Um, the unbeliever has no reason for reason. Okay, The atheist who lives and breathes and moves and has his being within a merely materialistic universe has no ground upon which he can stand to make a claim about the superiority and the necessity of the laws of logic that supposedly um, here prove or disprove the truthfulness of Christianity or theism. He's got no ground for it. He's got no basis for it. Think about it this way. What is it that laws claim to be? Laws claim to be laws. They're indubitable. They can't be doubted. Um, they can't change. They're laws that apply to everybody, according at least to the atheist. So, and that's his claim when he says, when he says Christianity and Christian theism are illogical or irrational, unpack that statement. I mean, behind that statement, there is so much. 
presupposed, namely that there exist principles and laws of logic and of rationality that apply to him and me, right? Between the believer and the unbeliever, that the laws of logic and the laws of rationality don't apply differently is his claim to believer and unbeliever. Now, we would agree with that, but he has no reason that he can say that that's true. Because if all there is, is a changing materialistic universe, who is to say that a law of logic, excuse me, or a principle of reasoning that is true today won't be untrue tomorrow, right? We would have to say that if all there is, is a changing materialistic universe, And the laws of logic are part of that changing materialistic universe, then the laws of logic must also change. In which case, there are no laws, right? There are no universals. And who's to say that in a changing materialistic universe that I don't have my own personal set of laws of logic and you have your own personal set? of laws of logic who's who's governing the relationship between me and you when it comes to debating about what is logical and what is not okay now on the basis of an atheistic materialistic worldview you can't you can't substantiate the existence of laws of logic whatsoever the unbeliever has no ground to stand on. And in fact, what he has to do, and this is what Van Til called, we talked about this before, this is what Van Til called borrowed capital. The unbeliever is presupposing for the moment and borrowing something from the Christian worldview, namely, as we believe, there are laws that govern all human beings. There's laws of logic, there's moral laws, there's laws of physics, there's laws of, of gravity, so forth and so on. With law of gra- the law of gravity is just a, a, a law of physics. But anyway, you get the idea. There are things that transcend matter and chance and change over time, right? And so, um, so what the unbeliever has done is he has borrowed the Christian worldview or something from the Christian worldview in order to make an argument against the Christian worldview, right? Um, And in that sense, he shows himself to be thoroughly and wholly or completely, I should say, hypocritical. He's seeking to argue against Christianity using the, the truths that Christianity itself alone can substantiate by way of a transcendent, personal, creating God. Okay? Now, um, I, I've said quite a bit already, and I've gone through that material very quickly, and we'll, we're going to talk about it some more. We're going to run through some more scenarios so that you sort of get the, um, get the gist and, and you're able to get a hang of the way that that you would argue presuppositionally with the unbeliever. But are there, are there any questions or comments? I'm just going to pause for a moment here um, about what has been said thus far. Okay. Very good. Let's uh, hopefully everybody's tracking well. If there are any, if there's a lack of clarity at any point, please uh, feel free to speak up or to jot your question or comment in the chat. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's let's come up with another scenario. Um, what are what are some of the other arguments that you hear unbelievers make against Christianity? Um, Here's here's one for you. Part of the, they'll say something like this, part of the reason why I can't believe in Christianity 
is because Christ, because Christian Christianity is made up of a bunch of Christians that do terrible things. Okay, true. You know, we. I mean, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna um, uh, deny that, right? You can't deny that. Uh, th- there is one thing that you could do. I see Christians do it all the time, and it's somewhat unbecoming, at least from my perspective. Oh yes, is there a question? Oh, that's Peter speaking. No, 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 what's the <laughs> Okay, no question. Okay. Yes. Or do you have a question, Peter? Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, entering the, the classroom right now. Ah, okay. Welcome. Okay. Very glad Thank you're you. here. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, okay. Uh, I'm asking for a friend. This is Rocky. How should we use the principles of our apologetic method in our case against other false religions like Buddhist, Taoists, or uh, Judaists? Very good question. Um, Rocky, can we can we save that for the end? Is that okay? Um, part of the part of the what I'd like to do is is continue to establish some of the principles here, and then we can uh, brought you know as we're talking to an atheist, we then can take the principles. And we can broaden them to other uh, false religions as well. Okay, um, it's a great question. I had the same question about how we argue presuppositionally with, uh, let's say, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Okay, um, and I think that goes along well with um, 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 defending the faith against Buddhists, Taoists, and um, so forth. So we'll get to that in a moment. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, let let let's get back to the um, the accusation of of uh, atheists or unbelievers against Christians or against Christianity because of the behavior of Christians. Okay, um, y- you know I think I think the first thing we must say is, hey, you know, mea culpa. Um, I'm a Christian not because I'm perfect. I'm a Christian because I'm forgiven. Right. Um, that's, <laughs> I, I still, each Christian has enough indwelling sin within us to commit the most unspeakable evils yet. I mean, it, it, it's scary to think of, but it's true. Um, and so one thing we wouldn't want to do is try to defend the sinful actions of other Christians or even our own sinful actions, right? Um, so, you know, there's, uh, we can make arguments all day long if if we would like about sinful actions of past Christians, for example. And, uh, you know, oh, look, look at what he did. Here's an example. Um, I don't like Martin Luther. He's a hypocritical Christian because he said he said anti-Semitic things. OK, I mean, we could. I think you can make a, a an argument, a historical argument that situates the comments that Luther made within his historical context so as to make those comments a little bit more understandable. Um, But that's not really how we want to defend the faith here. That's more of a a direct method that, um, you know, and while there certainly can be historical arguments to sort of explain the actions of Christians, I think it's better off to concede the point to the unbeliever and say, I concede your point. You're absolutely correct. There are many Christians throughout the history of the world who have done terrible, sinful things. Okay, granted. But here's where we can engage with the unbeliever at the presuppositional level, at the most basic level of things. Okay, let's assume the worldview of this unbeliever for a moment. There is no God. And there's only matter given chance and change over time, okay? Um, In a materialistic universe, where do we get morality from? I'm going to make a bold claim. I'm going to make a bold claim that, that I think needs to be made 
toward with the unbeliever at this point in a materialistic atheistic worldview there are no morals there's no such thing as ethics within a materialistic atheistic worldview all you have are feelings of offense that's it no laws of morality no ethical code at all on their presuppositions okay so you can say all right uh you know martin luther let's say was anti-semitic well who's to say on your worldview that anti-semitism is wrong right i mean who's to say it's immoral because after all in a in a wholly contained materialistic universe with no god all you have is chance and change over time which means what may be immoral for you today may not have been immoral for martin luther 500 years ago right who's to say that martin luther or anybody is wrong for their anti-semitism right or let's say for their racism okay i mean particularly this is an issue that comes up time and again here in america um because of our history of slavery and so forth and so on um the slavery is evil the way that slavery was practiced in this country shamefully 150 years ago and beyond is evil it was wrong and it was practiced by both christians and non-christians alike okay there were christians who defended the institution of slavery here in america the problem with slavery and the way that it was practiced particularly here in america is that it was chattel slavery which means that people were kidnapped from their homeland in africa they were brought here in america and they were sold as property okay um that's what our what the westminster standards call um man stealing and it's a violation of the law of god and so um people you know that you hear atheists make these arguments all the time you look at all those christians who practice chattel slavery and so forth and so on and and i've heard christians try to defend chattel slavery so it's to get christians off the hook <laughs> it's that's that's crazy concede the point right um because it is man stealing it is evil it is a sin the way that it was practiced back then christians were complicit in it you concede the point but the whole point is this only christians have the ground and the basis for being able to call chattel slavery evil on a materialistic evolutionary world view there is no right and there is no wrong there's might makes right right that's it so if i'm strong enough and i'm more and i'm powerful enough to go steal people from their home country and force them to work for me and sell them as property why not who's to say i can't do that or i shouldn't do that okay um so now we can press the unbeliever and we can say i agree that chattel slavery was evil and that christians should not have engaged in it but you on the basis of your world view you have no basis to call it wrong to call it immoral because matter does not form or create laws of morality it has no power to do it it has no power within itself to create out of nothing laws of morality um it can I mean, now even if you say that it can and if an atheist can make an argument that matter alone given chance and change over time is able to create out of nothing 
the existence of laws of morality, even if he could, he still now has the problem of having a materialistic universe which changes over time. So if laws of morality arise from within within matter itself, and matter changes all the time and evolves over time, then who's to say that the laws that supposedly arise out of matter don't also change over time? So what's wrong for you and for me today in 2024, we would say maybe chattel slavery is wrong. Who's to say 200 years ago or 150 years ago that it was also wrong? Maybe maybe the laws of morality changed with the changing matter from which it arises. Right. So the atheist has no basis, no ground, no solid foundation to make his or her ethical claims or claims of morality. There's no basis whatsoever. So now that we've engaged with the unbeliever in this way, you can see the way in which the Christian is able to pull the rug right out from underneath the unbeliever. We have shown his worldview to be incapable of substantiating his or her truth claims. Chattel slavery is immoral. Is it? Why? How? By what standard is it immoral? If you have no basis of universal moral law, you cannot make claims that any Christian at any time in any place has committed some sort of an evil because there is no standard of good and evil on the basis and the presuppositions of a Christian worldview, of a non-Christian worldview. So you can see what we've done. We've undercut um, the worldview of the unbeliever, but we've done so by stepping on his ground first and presupposing for the sake of argument, his worldview. And we have shown how given that worldview, assuming for the moment, assuming for the sake of argument that there is no God, we have been able to show that there's no basis then for the existence of laws of morality or laws of logic for that matter. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, Ben-Hur, more elaboration in atheistic uh, circular argument and a theistic linear argument well very good question ben her um and i think this goes this goes to van Til's system as a whole excuse me uh one thing to bear in mind is that at the end of the day all argumentation either for the existence of god or against the existence of god is going to be circular Okay, all reasoning is at the end of the day circular. Every atheist who makes an argument against the existence of God does so already presupposing his conclusion that there is no God. No atheist actually comes at the question of the existence of God in a neutral fashion and argues in a linear fashion to conclude the non-existence of God. He's already excluded the one true and living God at the outset of his reasoning. He may not admit that, and he may try to convince and persuade himself otherwise, but at the end of the day, all argumentation, either for the existence of God or against the existence of God, presupposes the conclusion to which it it argues towards which it argues. So, um, so there is there both the atheist and the theist are arguing in a circular fashion. We always presuppose the conclusion towards which we drive in our reasoning and in our um, argumentation. Okay, so there's no such thing as a purely linear argumentation, even though. Uh, Thomas Aquinas and uh, Anselm and others have tried to make those particular types of arguments. Let's um, 
<clears throat> I want to address a couple of more issues um, in addition to the a question that um, that Rocky had asked. So maybe three more scenarios. And um, and again, this is as we're wrapping up the class, we have now come to the point uh, of the practicum. And okay, this is the practical part of the application part of the class um, where we're talking about how do we take what we've learned already about the reformation of apologetics, the principles that Van Til has given us, our reformed uh, theological principles. How do we apply that now concretely in, in the real life, on the street engagement with the unbeliever? Okay, so that's where we're at here in the class as we're starting to wrap things up. Um, <clears throat> I want to I want to address another scenario. Okay, this scenario has to is is similar to the last one we talked about because it's a scenario uh, that's on the basis of morality or ethics. Okay, I, maybe y'all have heard this one before. The reason why I don't believe in Christianity is because I cannot and I will not believe in the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible is evil. And um, and, and in that scenario, we might say, oh, well, tell me more. How, how is the God of, of the Bible evil? Why, why do you make that conclusion? And the unbeliever may say something along these lines. Well, as I read the pages of the Bible, the God of the Bible commits genocide. Okay, well, well, tell me more. What, what do you mean uh, commits genocide? Well, you remember in the Bible, this is the unbeliever speaking now. You remember in the Bible, don't you, where God tells Israel and commands Israel to destroy all of the Canaanites. All the inhabitants of the land are to be destroyed completely. And none are to be spared. No man, no woman, no child, no cattle is to be spared. Um, what Israel is called to do is ethnic cleansing. They are to cleanse the land of all of its inhabitants, not to make a covenant with them. They're not even allowed to bring them into slavery and to uh, subject them to uh, subjugate them to to the kingdom of Israel, they're not allowed to go on and exist anymore. They are what is called harem warfare. Israel is to perform harem warfare, whereby Israel is commanded to kill every inhabitant of the land. And in fact, even the Psalms talk about taking the babies of the inhabitants of the land and dashing them against the rocks, right? So um, what a terrible God you have. What an immoral, unethical God that you worship. I can't worship that God. Now, maybe hypothetically, there will be some other God, one more benevolent than your God, that I can worship, but I can't worship the God of the Bible. I've heard this argument numerous times. Maybe you have as well. How do we defend the faith once for all delivered to the saints against that claim? Well, it's very similar to the claim that uh, was made previous about bringing moral accusations against Christians. Okay. Number one, we cannot deny the facts that the atheist has just articulated. It is true that in the Bible, God does order the destruction of all of the inhabitants of the land. Now, you could call that ethnic cleansing or something else. You could call it genocide or something else. Those are particularly loaded terms that are intended by the atheist to solicit emotion in people. Um, but you know, we don't want to we don't want to argue about whether or not uh, we don't want to argue over terms, <laughs> over words. Call it whatever you want. It is what it is. It is true. God commands the thorough 
destruction of all of the inhabitants of the land so that Israel would possess the land. <clears throat> we don't want to argue against that. That's true enough. Where our argument lies, however, is with the presuppositions of the unbeliever, which disallow the unbeliever to actually conclude rationally any accusation against God. In other words, given a universe where there is only matter and chance and change over time, there can be no valid accusation of immorality against God. If chance and change over time is all there is, then whether you consider the God of the Bible a, simply a mythological creature or mythological character or what have you, the atheist can, cannot rationally or logically bring an argument against the character that is called God in the Bible. He can't. He's got no basis for it. He's got no, no, um, uh, no ground to stand upon. Um, who's to say that if, if, if the laws of morality arise from, from matter alone, and matter is that which changes because of chance over time. Who's to say that morality doesn't change such that back in the days of Israel conquering the land, genocide was completely morally valid, even if it's not today? Who's to say that tomorrow genocide won't be morally valid? even if it's not today, because everything's changing. And if everything changes, there is no such thing as law. The only law there is, is the law of change. It's pure change. And a universe where there is pure change, there is only pure chance. And everything is impersonal, and everything is immoral. Now, I'm going to put that in the chat here, how I mean that expression. Oops, sorry. When I say immoral, I'm not saying that everything is wrong. We, we can use the word immoral that way. We can say that there are wrong actions. Those are immoral actions. I'm talking about there <clears throat> everything in a in a universe where there's chance and change over time everything is amoral or immoral it's without morality there are no value judgments there can be no value judgments in an atheistic materialistic universe okay so any claim that an atheist makes about morality, whether it's a claim against God or other Christians, he cannot make that claim logically. It does not flow from his worldview. Okay, and we're see, and now we're seeking to push that pressure point with the unbeliever or the atheist in order to force him to see that on the basis of his worldview, he cannot make any claims, any ethical claims whatsoever whether against Christians or against God. In fact, what he's doing, and we have to show him this too, in fact, what he's doing is he is actually presupposing the Christian worldview for a moment in order to make an argument against Christianity. That's the irony of the whole thing. He has to presuppose the Christian worldview in order to argue against Christianity. He needs to presuppose the existence of a law-giving God in order to make an argument against the actions of God. Okay? So you're starting to get the, the drift now, right? You're starting to get the gist as to how these things, um, how such an engagement can take place. The process of making an, an indirect proof or giving indirect proof for the existence of God by 
showing the impossibility of the worldview of the unbeliever. The unbeliever's worldview is impossible. And so we're offering an alternative instead. Um, <clears throat> now, let me just say this. There is um, uh, something we need to, I, I think it would be helpful for us, not to do in this class, but I think it's helpful for every Christian to try to understand what's going on with regard to the um, uh, the conquest of the land in Canaan. How it is that, or why it is that God commands Israel to cleanse the land of all the inhabitants, okay? How that differs from what we talk about today as genocide, where, you know, basically one country goes into another country and cleanses the land of all its people um, by way of mass slaughtering, um, why that's immoral, and it is immoral, why ethnic cleansing today is immoral, but the cleansing of the lands back in the days of the theocracy of Israel is not immoral, okay? We need to think about that, and I think good biblical theology, understanding what's going on in the Bible, biblically, theologically, in terms of the covenants, um, and particularly the Mosaic administration of the covenant of grace, why uh, why is that different than ethnic cleansing today if one country goes into another country and kills all its people? Um, why is it different? And how is it different? That's a subject for a whole other class. We're not going to get into that here. But um, the point is this, for our purposes here, um, the unbeliever can be shown to have a futile worldview when they make claims against the actions of God in the Bible by showing that the atheist has no ground upon which to stand to make moral or ethical claims whatsoever. Okay. Um, let me pick up the question here by Ben Hur. In an atheistic materialistic worldview, chance and change over time, then an atheist can't fully trust even his own thinking and reasonings. Well, I wouldn't put it quite that way, Ben-Hur. I think it's more like the atheist doesn't have a rational basis for the for the truth claims that he makes, right? Um, it, um, it, now, there is a sense in where the atheist can't trust his own thinking and reasonings to a certain extent because ultimately his thinking is futile because his thoughts are not being brought captive to the obedience of Christ. Um, so his thinking is always going to be futile at the end of the day. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the atheist can't make correct deductions and logical deductions um, and even make uh, truthful uh, uh, ethical claims. And so, um, you know, he, he's, he would be truthful if he were to say chattel slavery was evil. Right? We'd be like, okay, Right. You know, that's that's good. You recognize that. The problem is you don't have a basis for it. OK, you need then. And here's the more positive um, approach to our apologetic. We don't just pull the rug out from the atheist's feet and then leave the atheist's worldview um, decimated. And, and don't get me wrong. Um, I mean, here here this. When you argue this way with an unbeliever, whether he acknowledges the truthfulness of the argument or not, you have decimated his worldview. You have turned it upside down. You have shown it to be futile and, and irrational. And you've decimated it. You've, you've torn it to the ground. But you can't leave the atheist there with a decimated worldview, right? We need to propose something instead a truth that is there instead. And that truth, of course, is the truth of the Christian worldview, okay? And we say now, because remember, you've never left the Christian worldview. You have never at any point with the atheist said, let me suspend my belief in the triune God for a moment, step on common ground with you, the atheist, and and reason together in such a way that 
we the conclusion of our reasoning is is open to whatever the truth may be. No, we believe what the truth is already at the outset of that discussion, and we never suspend it. In fact, we presuppose it in order to make sense of all of reality. So um, when we argue with the atheist this way, we then say, okay, now adopt my worldview, even if just for the sake of argument for a moment, okay? In my worldview, I can account for immoral actions. For, in my worldview, I can account for universal moral law, okay? Um, in my view, in my worldview, I can account for laws of logic and for rationality. Now, the atheist may be able to reason, but the atheist has no reason for reason, right? The atheist can use reason and can even use it correctly to a certain extent, at least externally, can make valid rational deductions. <clears throat> but the atheist can never substantiate the existence of reason or laws of logic on his worldview, right? He can't do it. Um, so what we're saying is now try on the Christian worldview. Given the Christian worldview, now you can see that there is a rational basis for logic, for morality, and so forth and so on. And there's one other thing before we get to Rocky's question about other religions. There's one other scenario I want to run through with you. Okay. And um, that's that scenario is is one about evidence. Okay. So uh, as you know, within the practice of Christian apologetics. Other than the classical approach that we've talked about before, Thomas Aquinas and so forth, you also have the evidentialist approach, sometimes called evidentialism. Um, evidentialism is characterized by um, the well-known book by Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Okay, um, If you're familiar at all with that book, um, what Josh McDowell is doing is seeking to give uh, all, all of these evidential arguments and all these evident, uh, uh, evidential facts to substantiate and support the claims of Christianity. Perfectly useful book and, and facts that are helpful and that can be useful, okay? But here's the problem, okay? When you have an argument or a discussion confrontation apologetic endeavor with an unbeliever um if if all you talk about with that unbeliever are facts all you're going to do is throw facts back and forth at each other he's going to have facts that supposedly disprove christianity and then you're going to give counter facts that supposedly support and prove christianity but here's part of the problem you and the atheist, you don't think the same way about facts, right? So, so what is a fact? And and let me let me ask you this question as well: um, Why are facts even important? You know, is the atheist even even valid to demand facts? And and here's part of the problem. There is no such thing as a brute fact, right? Every fact is interpreted, and every fact comes within a, a context, okay, related to every other fact. And we don't, we can't be able to properly interpret any fact until we have interpreted facts in the light of Scripture, of special revelation in light of God. After all, as Van Til would say, there are no brute facts. Why? Because God has already interpreted every fact. God's mind, eternal as it is, 
knows every fact infallibly, exhaustively, and infinitely. He knows it all. Okay? We're simply called to think God's thoughts after him. Okay? We're supposed to interpret the facts in a way that God has interpreted them. How do we know how God interprets facts? We know how God interprets facts only by way of his revelation. God reveals to us, particularly in the pages of the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, God reveals to us something of his interpretation of all and every fact. So that means that at no point with the atheist can we suspend scripture in order to go to some fact outside of scripture to prove scripture. Because what does that do? That puts scripture then, in terms of its authority, under my presentation and interpretation of facts. Okay? And let's call that for what it is. That's just human arrogance and pride. Right? To think that we can place facts and my interpretation thereof over scripture so as to sub, to subordinate uh to um uh, uh to cause scripture to be subordinate to facts and the inter my interpretation thereof okay facts don't interpret scripture scripture interprets the facts okay we begin with scripture in order to interpret facts and in order to talk about a philosophy of facts at all. The atheist actually has absolutely no ground upon which he can stand to talk about the primacy or the importance of facts. Okay? A fact is interpreted by God and we know the interpretation of those facts only because scripture gives us the interpretation of those facts. Okay, so at no point with the atheist can we suspend scripture in order to entertain facts either for or against scripture. Okay, and here we can challenge the atheist on the philosophy of fact. What we can say that facts are important, and they are important, but we can say that they're important only because we already presuppose the Christian worldview. Without the Christian worldview, the importance of facts itself, that, that importance itself cannot be substantiated on the basis of a materialistic universe where there is only chance and change over time. Okay? So um, that's, um, that's the practicum, if you will, that I wanted to talk about talk through with you guys so that you can perhaps get get a sense and get a um uh get the gist of what it means to um, engage with an, an unbeliever i would encourage you as you have opportunity to practice this like in real life find an atheist somewhere uh, online in real life whatever um, find an atheist and begin to have conversations with him about these things and begin to put into practice some of the uh, um, the approach that we have talked about, which this approach, everything I've been highlighting for you and outlining for you is oftentimes called TAG. We've talked about this before, but I'm just refreshing y'all's memory, which is the transcendental argument for the existence of God, TAG. Um, it's it's called a transcendent. Van Til called it a transcendental argument because it's indirect. It's not um, sort of a direct argumentation. It's indirect. What you're doing is you are coming over to the other side and evaluating a perspective on the basis of the presuppositions of that perspective. Okay, transcendental argument for the existence of God is just another expression for 
presuppositionalism or presuppositional apologetics. Um, now, be careful, because not all transcendent, transcendental arguments are the same. Okay, You can go online and you can look up tag or transcendental arguments for the existence of God, and some of them are better than others. Okay, I've seen transcendental arguments for the for the existence of God um, used so poorly that the end result of their argument is really just a generic God, a generic deity, just like you would get with um, the the direct proofs or the direct arguments like you find in the cosmological or or um, ontological arguments. So um, tra the tag or the transcendental argument for the existence of God is not just another logical proof for the existence of God. It's much more than that. It, it's, it's, an, it's an actual face-to-face -face engagement with an unbeliever in his or her worldview, whereby you're seeking to show the atheist that on the basis of his or her worldview, he has no ground upon which to stand to make the truth claims he does. Okay. Um, all right. Let's um, let's wrap up with talking about Rocky's question at the beginning. Um, the question he's asking for a friend about the method in the case of false religions like Buddhism, Taoism, or Judaism. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I think that, first of all, I'm no expert in Buddhism, Taoism, or, or a, a, any of these other kind of world religions, false religions. Um, so I'm going to try to do my best here. But there's one thing that um, distinguishes all of those religions from Christianity, and that is that they deny the Trinity. Okay, And remember, we're we begin our presupposition is on the basis of not a generic faceless god or faceless gods right but it is on the basis of the triune god who is the eternal one and many okay he is one being in three persons and eternally so now world religions okay um and i mean if, if you talk about you know, I just don't know the details of Buddhism, Taoism, and all of that, or Hinduism for that. I mean, Hinduism has many gods. Buddhism is basically atheist. Uh, don't know much about Taoism. Um, but think with me, if you will, about some of these. Um, okay, let, let's take, let, let's compare Hinduism and Buddhism, okay? Hinduism um, has its emphasis upon the many. There are many gods in in Hinduism. Buddhism, even though it's kind of atheistic, there is sort of a god. Uh, call it Nirvana, or call it sort of, you know, this this elevation um, to the highest order. Uh, probably the th you could probably call that highest order the One or the Universe, right? Like. Uh, Buddhism's got all these, you know, kind of strange things, but there's this elevation of the human consciousness to like pure consciousness. Okay. So Hinduism uh, has the many. Um, Buddhism has the one. Okay. The problem with both of them is that they have the one without the other. Okay. They have a God, if you will. If I could use that expression, even for Buddhism, they they have they have a god um, that is incoherent. Okay, um, in Hinduism or in Buddhism, where the emphasis is on the one, and that, by the way, would be the same thing with the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower theology, right? Watchtower theology has <clears throat> has only uh, uh, one person. Um, which really renders God personless, impersonal, okay? What makes our God personal is the fact that within the Godhead himself, there is personal relation among the three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
excuse me, God does not need to relate to creation in order to become personal. Okay. Which is, which is what watchtower theology teaches. Okay. Same thing with Islam. Okay. Islam's God and the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses is basically the same God. It's one person in one being and in and of himself is not personal. He can't be because there's no personal relationship within himself. Okay. For both Jehovah's Watchtower theology, and I would add also uh, Hindu, uh, 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 Buddhism in this, and Islam, right? The God that is the one becomes personal when he relates to creation, or in the case of, of Buddhism, when creation relates to him. It, really, on Buddhism's grounds, but you get the idea. <clears throat> there's a uh, personality um, gets completely swallowed up and there can be in, and, and here's where rationality comes in, right? If you have a being who is impersonal, not only does he have no relationship and know of no relationship within himself, but he cannot, Logically, he cannot relate to creation. He cannot relate to others because he himself is nothing. And we've said this before about a generic deity. This faceless, personless God cannot relate to creation at all because he is in himself impersonal and is nothing more than just simply a blob. It's just a blob. I mean, it's just. It's just a blob of something. I don't know what a blob of being, um, but it's not. Per but that God is not personal, and cannot relate to creation at all. Okay, because he does. Because he, he knows nothing of relation in and of himself. Okay. Now the opposite problem obtains when you talk about Hinduism and their many gods. You can say the same also about Mormonism. OK, so, <clears throat> you know, you, you put Mormonism and Hinduism in the same category because both Hinduism and Mormonism ha are polytheistic. OK, just like how we're put in um, we're putting Buddhism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam in the same category because both of them are um, are pantheistic. Yes. Right. As uh, uh, Rocky had put in there. And so um, what you find here's the problem if you have many gods who don't share the same being, okay, you actually have no God. Um, you've got, you have a multiplicity, whether you're talking about in Mormonism or if you're talking about in Hinduism, you have a number of deities with their own distinct being and personality such that, and this is inevitable, even if you talk about Greek or uh, Roman ancient classical mythology, it's the same thing. What you have, you don't have a God, you have gods. And those gods, because they have a distinct being and they have a distinct personality, are at some point in conflict with one another. Okay? Think about Mormonism for a moment. Okay? You have in Mormonism a bunch of God's spiritual babies who over time, if they're good Mormons, become themselves gods, okay? Which means that God, or what, what the Mormons call Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father um, is himself also an elevated deity. He at one time also was a spiritual baby who himself had a Heavenly Father, and his heavenly father at one time was a spiritual baby who became a heavenly father and so forth and so on. So you have this infinite regress in Mormonism of a relationship of, of multiple and many gods. And it just goes on forever, right? You know, consumes this eternal universe, um, which is populated with, you know, these spiritual babies that become themselves heavenly fathers. <clears throat> and so... The problem with that 
is that there is no basis or there is no standard for anything universal at all. You have multiple gods, you have multiple beings with mo multiple personalities, and the question is this, who calls the shots, right? In a worldview, in a universe like that, where you have multiple gods, which god is the one that determines what truth, what morality, and what the laws of logic are? Who's to say that the god of the one universe in Mormonism doesn't have different rules than the god in a different universe? And when those two collide, who's to say who's right and who's wrong? There is no transcendent universal being with universal personality to determine the laws of the creature because after all he's just a creature heavenly father is just a creature for mormonism and mormons who become gods are also just merely creatures they may be elevated creatures but they're still just creatures which is kind of interesting how at the end of the day the polytheism of Mormonism really becomes nothing more than pantheism because all of their gods are a part of creation, right? None of them transcend creation. They're just creatures. And it's the same thing with Hinduism, right? <clears throat> Hinduism's many gods are just creatures. Same thing with classical mythology, the gods of, of classical mythology. They too are simply creatures. And so the gods are a part of creation. Creation are a part of the gods. That's pantheism, right? So um, anyway, uh, that's sort of a quick overview. I have a question here from Ben Hur. Um, can we use Francis Schaeffer's religion from below versus religion from above or of nature versus grace of Bavink all on the basis of revelation? Uh, uh, good question, Ben Hur. Um, not sure how best to answer it. Um, I'm not familiar enough with Schaefer, uh, to I mean, I've read Schaefer, but uh, his, as you say here, religion from above, religion uh, from below. Um, yeah, I mean. I, as I understand that distinction in Schaefer, uh, that's he's just making use of the creator creature distinction. He learned that from Van Til. Um, so I have no problems with that. Uh, there's, you know, we Christianity alone believes in a religion from above. Everything else is religion from below and is at the end of the day just materialism. So, I mean, even Buddhism is materialism. Uh, Mormonism is materialism, right? Um, <clears throat> and really, at the end of the day, um, Islam is materialism because the God of Islam is so impersonal and abstract in and of himself, he actually cannot relate to creation, which means that all you have is creation. You have no God. <laughs> so at the end of the day, when you follow Islam out to its logical conclusion, it really is simply a materialistic worldview. Um, any type of interaction with Allah is pretended. It's mythology. Um, because Allah cannot really rationally, logically relate to creation. He's impersonal. He cannot have a personal relationship with creation. Um, as for Bavink, uh, nature versus grace, I... You know, the I, I'm not sure Bavink would put it that way, actually. Um, Bavink doesn't really believe in sort of pitting nature against grace. Um, <clears throat> in fact, if anything, Bavink and Neo Calvinism uh, run afoul of the nature grace distinction. That's a whole other class, a whole other discussion. Um, so uh, Bavink, I think, would be more inclined towards saying that grace perfects nature uh, rather than against it. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, that's sort of my best shot at trying to address the Bavink question, but.
But everything has to be done on the basis of revelation. That's the point of Van Til's presuppositionalism. We never, we never leave revelation in order to make an argument for revelation. And yes, it's a circular argument. There's, there's no other ground to stand upon than God and his revelation. Anything else is a false God, and it's to betray God at the outset. I'll be that blunt. Any other questions or comments? I, uh, oh, Rocky, were you trying to say something? You were on mute. Uh, no question. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure if I saw your lips moving. Okay, great. Well, um, that, that does conclude the material for the class. And uh, if Rocky has any other announcements about the class and its wrap up, I'll, I'll let him do that here in a moment. But I uh, just want to point a personal privilege to say thank you to everyone for listening patiently to me ramble on. Uh, hopefully, uh, I've been able to at least strike a point of clarity here or there that had been helpful and useful to you. Um, I would encourage, as you're able to, to go back and listen to the recordings of the class to sort of solidify some of the principles that we've been trying to uh, impress upon you. And uh, my prayer is that the Lord will help, will use uh, this material to help you in real life, practical, on the streets, as it were, apologetic endeavors so that you can, to the glory of God, defend the faith once we're all delivered to the saints. So thank you, everyone. We will just make our announcement in our group chat. Cool. Pastor Rocky, uh, can I lean upon you to close our time in prayer? Uh, sure. Uh, baka mga kapatid po itang, uh, can, can we please uh, show ourselves on the screen? So uh, we'll be praying together. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you because of your goodness and of your mercy. Thank you for the privilege of listening to the lectures of Dr. Jim Cassidy. Thank you for using him and uh, giving us the privilege to, to learn how to defend the faith and to, to use the scripture alone as the ultimate and the sole authority of how we interact between us and the unbelievers, those who do not deny your existence. We thank you for all the lectures that we have so far uh, heard and uh, uh, learned with. Thank you for everyone that has participated in this uh, this uh, course, we pray that uh, you will encourage us more, uh, make uh, Dr. Cassidy uh, more useful again uh, as he teach another course in the latter, uh, latter uh, course of our studies. We pray that you will enable us to defend the faith, uh, that uh, you empower us to, to, to show ourselves capable of uh, defending your word and we pray that we'll be useful in our respective churches and that you may be glorified in whatever we do whether we eat or drink for your glory and we pray that uh, tonight as we part our ways that you may bless each and every one of us and bless uh, our work this uh these weekdays as we seek to glorify you in whatever we do. Thank you, Father, once and for all, for everything that you, you have done so far to us in the Lord's seminary. Bless us as we part our ways. These things we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, mag-selfie mo, muna tayo siguro. Can, can we make a selfie? Uh, selfie? Anyone, anyone, no, no selfie. Anyone can, can to 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 have uh, to screenshot
I cannot turn on my camera. Oh, okay, no okay. problem. <laughs> Now it works. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. I am outside, that's why I don't want to. Okay, I okay. Screenshot. Okay. Ah. Uh, okay, thank you, class. Thank you very much. Wait, 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, brothers. Yes, you. Thank you very God much. Bless. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you.